Hello, happy believers. Welcome to my art gallery and to painting number 53. I will continue reading from the Catechism from Part 2, Section 2, Chapter 3, Article 7. I will start with a prayer. O Holy Spirit, beloved of my soul, I adore you. Enlighten, guide, strengthen and console me. Tell me what I ought to do and command me to do it. I promise to submit to everything that you ask of me and to accept all that you allow to happen to me. Just show me what is your will. I hope you enjoyed the audio and if you enjoy visiting my art gallery, please like, subscribe and share. I will also leave a few personal thoughts on my painting in the description below. Article 7. The Sacrament of Matrimony The matrimonial covenant by which a man and a woman establish between themselves and a partnership of the whole of life is by its nature ordered toward the good of the spouses and the procreation and education of offspring. This covenant between baptised persons has been raised by Christ the Lord to the dignity of a sacrament. 1. Marriage in God's Plan Sacred Scripture begins with the creation of men and women in the image and likeness of God and concludes with a vision of the wedding feast of the Lamb. Scripture speaks throughout of marriage and its mystery, its institution and the meaning of God has given it, its origin and its end, its various realisations throughout the history of salvation, the difficulties arising from sin and its renewal in the Lord in the new covenant of Christ and the Church. Marriage in the Order of Creation the intimate community of life and love, which constitutes the married state, has been established by the Creator and endowed by Him with its own proper laws. God Himself is the author of marriage. The vocation to marriage is written in the very nature of men and women, as they came from the hand of the Creator. Marriage is not a purely human institution, despite the many variations it may have undergone through the centuries in different cultures, social structures and spiritual attitudes. These differences should not cause us to forget its common and permanent characteristics. Although the dignity of this institution is not transparent, everywhere with the same clarity. Some sense of the greatness of the matrimonial union exists in all country cultures. The well-being of the individual person and of both human and Christian society is closely bound up with the healthy state of conjugal and family life. God who created men out of love also calls him to love. The fundamental and innate vocation of every human being, for man is created in the image and likeness of God, who is himself love. Since God created him, man and woman, their mutual love becomes an image of the absolute and unfailing love with which God loves men. It is good, very good, in the Creator's eyes. And this love which God blesses is intended to be fruitful and to be realised in the common work of watching over creation. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it. Holy Scripture affirms that men and women were created for one another. It is not good that men should be alone. The woman, flesh of his flesh, his equal, 
He's nearest in all things, is given to him by God as a helpmate. She thus represents God from whom comes our help. Therefore, a man leaves his father and his mother and cleaves to his wife, and they become one flesh. The Lord himself shows that this signifies an unbreakable union of their two lives by recalling what the plan of the Creator had been in the beginning. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Marriage under the regime of sin. Every man experiences evil around him and within him. This experience makes itself felt in the relationships between men and women. Their union has always been threatened by discord. A spirit of denomination, infidelity, jealousy and conflicts that can escalate into hatred and separation. This disorder can manifest itself more or less acutely and can more or less overcome according to the circumstances of cultures, eras and individuals. But it does not seem to have a universal character. According to faith, the disorder we notice so painfully does not stem from the nature of men and women, nor from the nature of their relations, but from sin. As a break with God, the first sin had its own, had its first consequence, the rupture of the original communion between men and women. Their relations were distorted by mutual recriminations, their mutual attraction, the Creator's own gift, changed into a relationship of denomination and lust. And the beautiful vocation of men and women to be fruitful, multiplied and subdue the earth was burdened by the pain of childbirth and the toil of work. Nevertheless, the order of creation persists, though seriously disturbed. To heal the wounds of sin, men and women need the help of the grace that God in his infinite mercy never refuses them. Without his help and help, men and women cannot achieve the union of their lives for which God created them. In the beginning. Marriage under the pedagogy of the law. In his mercy, God has not forsaken sinful men. The punishments consequent upon sin. Pain in the childbearing and toil in the sweat of your brow. Also embody remedies that limit the damaging effects of sin. After the fall, Marriage helps to overcome self-absorption, egoism, pursuit of one's own pleasure, and to open oneself to the order and open oneself to the other, to mutual aid and to self-giving. More conscience concerning the unity and indissolubility of marriage developed under the pedagogy of the law. In the Old Testament, the the polygamy of patriarchs and kings is not yet explicitly rejected. Nevertheless, the law given to Moses aims at protecting the wife from arbitrary denomination by the husband even though, according to the Lord's words, it still carries traces of men's hardness of heart, which was the reason Moses permitted men to divorce their wives. 
seeing God's covenant with Israel in the image of exclusive and faithful married love. The prophets prepared the chosen, people's conscience, for a deeper, deepened understanding of the unity and indissolubility of marriage. The books of Ruth and Tobit bear moving witness to an elevated sense of marriage and to the fidelity and tenderness of spouses. Tradition has always seen in the Song of Solomon a unique expression of human love insofar as it is a reflection of God's love, a love strong as death that many waters cannot quench. Marriage in the Lord The nuptial covenant between God and his people Israel had prepared the way for the new and everlasting covenant in which the Son of God, by becoming incarnate and giving his life, has united to himself in a certain way all mankind and saved by him, thus preparing for the wedding feast of the Lamb. On the threshold of his public life, Jesus performs his first sign at his mother's request during a wedding feast. The church attaches great importance to Jesus' presence at the wedding feast at Cana. She sees in it the confirmation of the goodness of marriage and the proclamation that henceforth marriage will be an efficacious sign of Christ's presence. In this preaching, Jesus unequivocally taught the original meaning of the union of men and women as as the Creator willed it. From the beginning, permission given by Moses to divorce one's wife was concession to the hardness of hearts. The matrimonial union of men and women is indissoluble. God himself has determined it. What, therefore, God has joined together, let no man put asunder. This unequivocal insistence on the indissolubility of the marriage bond may have left some perplexed and could seem to be a demand impossible to realise. However, Jesus has not placed on spouses a burden impossible to bear or too heavy, heavier than the law of Moses. By coming to restore the original order of creation disturbed by sin, he himself gives the strength and grace to live marriage in the new dimension of the reign of God. It is by following Christ, renouncing themselves and taking up their crosses, that spouses will be able to receive the original meaning of marriage and live it with the help of Christ. This grace of Christian marriage is a fruit of Christ's cross, the source of all Christian life. This is what the Apostle Paul makes clear when he says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her. Adding at once, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one. This is a great mystery and I mean in reference to Christ and the Church. The entire Christian life bears the mark of the spousal love of Christ and the Church. Already baptism, the entry into the people of God, a nuptial mystery, is a nuptial mystery. It is, so to speak, the nuptial bath, which precedes the wedding feast, the Eucharist. Christian marriage, in its turn, becomes an efficacious sign, the sacrament of the covenant of Christ and the Church. Since it signifies and communicates grace, marriage between baptised persons is a true sacrament of the new covenant. Virginity 
for the sake of the kingdom. Christ is a center of all Christian life. The bond with him takes precedence over all other bonds. Familial or social. From the very beginning of the church, there have been men and women who have been renounced the great good of marriage. From the very beginning of the church, there have been men and women who have renounced the great good of marriage to follow the Lamb wherever he goes, to be intent on the things of the Lord, to seek to please him, and to go out to meet the bridegroom who is coming. Christ himself has invited certain persons to allow him in this way. Christ himself has invited certain persons to follow him in this way of life, of which he remains the model. For there are eunuchs who have been so from birth, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. He who is able to receive this, let him receive it. Virginity for the sake of the kingdom of heaven is an unfolding of baptismal grace, a powerful sign of the supremacy of the bond with Christ and of the ardent expectation of his return a sign which will also recall also recalls that marriage is a reality of this present age which is passing both the sacrament of matrimony and virginity for the kingdom of god come from the lord himself it is he who gives the meaning and grants them the grace which is indispensable for living them out in conformity with his will. Esteem of virginity for the sake of the kingdom and the Christian understanding of marriage are inseparable and they reinforce each other. Whoever denigrates marriage also diminishes the glory of virginity. Whoever praises it makes virginity more admirable and replendent. What appears good only in comparison with evil would not be truly good. The most excellent good is something even better than what is admitted to be good. 2. The Celebration of Marriage In the Latin rite of the celebration of marriage between two Catholic faithful normally takes place during Holy Holy Mass. Because of the connection of all the sacraments with the Paschal mystery of Christ, in the Eucharist the memorial of the New Covenant is realised. The New Covenant in which Christ has united himself forever to the Church. His beloved Bride for whom he gave himself up. It is therefore fitting that the spouses should seal their consent to give themselves to each other through the offering of their own lives by uniting it to the offering of Christ for his church made present in the Eucharistic sacrifice and by receiving the Eucharist so that communicating In the same body and the same blood of Christ, they may form but one body in Christ. Inasmuch as it is a sacramental action of sanctification, the liturgical celebration of marriage must be per se valid, worthy and fruitful. It is therefore appropriate for the bride and groom to prepare themselves for the celebration of their marriage by receiving the sacrament of penance. According to the Latin tradition, spouses as ministers 
of Christ's grace mutually confer upon each other the sacrament of matrimony by expressing their consent before the church. In the traditions of the Eastern churches, the priests, bishops or presbyters are witnesses to the mutual consent given by the spouses. But for the validity of the sacrament, their blessing is also necessary. The various liturgies abound in prayers of blessing and epiclesis, asking God's grace and blessing on the new couple, especially the bride. In this epiclesis of this sacrament, the spouses receive the Holy Spirit as the communion of love of Christ and the Church. The Holy Spirit is the seal of their covenant, the ever-available source of their love and the strength to renew their fidelity. 3. Matrimonial Consent The parties to a marriage covenant are a baptised man and woman, free to contract marriage, who freely express the consent to be free means. Not being under constraint, not impeded by any natural or ecclesiastical law. The Church holds the exchange of consent between the spouses to be the indispensable element that makes the marriage. If consent is lacking, there is no marriage. The consent means in a human, the consent consists in a human act by which the partners mutually give themselves to each other. I take you to be my wife. I take you to be my husband. This consent that binds the spouses to each other finds its fulfilment in the two becoming one flesh. The consent must be an act of the will of each of the contracting parties, free of coercion or grave external fear. No human power can substitute for this consent. If this freedom is lacking, the marriage is invalid. For this reason, or for other reasons that render the marriage null and void, the Church, after an examination of the situation by the competent ecclesiastical tribunal, can declare the nullity of a marriage, i.e. that the marriage never existed. In this case, the contracting parties are free to marry provided the natural obligations of a previous union are discharged. The priest or deacon who assists at the celebration of a marriage receives the consent of the spouses in the name of the church and gives the blessing of the church. The presence of the church's minister and also of the witnesses visibly expresses the fact that the marriage is an ecclesial reality. This is the reason why the Church normally requires that the faithful contract marriage according to the ecclesiastical form. Several reasons converge to explain this requirement. Sacramental marriage is a liturgical act. It is therefore appropriate that it should be celebrated in the public liturgy of the Church. Marriage introduces one to an ecclesial order and creates rights and duties in the Church between the spouses and towards their children. Since marriage is a state of life in the Church, certainty about it is necessary, hence the obligation to have witnesses. The public character of the consent protects the I do once given and helps the spouses remain faithful to it. So that the I do of the spouses may be a free and responsible act 
and so that the marriage covenant may have solid and lasting human and Christian foundations. Preparation for marriage is of prime importance. The example and teaching given by parents and families remain the special form of the preparation. The special form of this preparation. The role of pastors and of the Christian community as the family of God is indispensable for the transmission of the human and Christian values of marriage and family. And much more so in our era when many young people experience broken homes which no longer sufficiently assure the, this initiation. It is imperative to give suitable and timely instruction to young people, above all in the heart of their own families, about the dignity of married love, married love, its role and its exercise, so that, having learned the value of chastity, they will be able, as a suitable age, to engage in honourable courtship and enter upon a marriage of their own. That concludes my session for today. I hope you enjoyed listening and reflecting on my painting. I hope you find it as educational as I do. I will not be editing my audio, so apologies for mispronouncing pronouncing some words. Some chapters are easier than others. Please like, subscribe and share so we can all live our wonderful Catholic faith together in all its richness. I will now finish with a prayer. O angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom God's love commits me here, ever today be at my side, to light and guard, to rule and guide. Amen. <laughs>